So you're, uh, last time, right? Uh, I, I wrote, well, I, I guess I, so we, we would think of space, whether space time or just space is filled with a field, a vectorial field, actually two vectorial fields, E and B, so the electric and the magnetic field. Uh, and uh, uh, Maxwell equations uh, describe how these, these, these two fields behave in space, okay? And uh, you can have many different fields uh, in, in space. Uh, like in this room, uh, we, 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 you can have scale, scalar fields, like for instance, the temperature in this room, each point uh, right in, in this room has a different temperature. And if you describe this, uh, uh, this field, uh, it's just a scalar quantity at each point, right? So that's a scalar field. On the other hand, uh, if, you, if you describe the, the motion of the air in this room, uh, the air moves, so it's a velocity field. And so it's a velocity field uh, uh, is described by a vector field. And last time I told you this is the way you should think about the, the electric and the magnetic fields as a sort of velocity fields, even though they are not a velocity, right? But you, you should close your eyes and think of this room as filled with these uh, little vectors everywhere, right? Meaning uh, the E and the B fields, okay? And in fact, indeed, this room is filled with this E and B field, right? Uh, because there are, uh, well, there, there are probably electrostatic and magnetic fields, but there are also electromagnetic waves, obviously, uh, and they are filled, I mean, we, we are uh, everywhere, right? Uh, uh, if your cell phones works on this, uh, I mean, our everyday life is based on uh, electric and magnetic fields. So you should close your eyes and think of, of, of all these vectors. And then uh, uh, this, this particular, these two particular vector fields, E and B, uh, the way the, these vectors behave in space uh, is described uh, by Maxwell equations, OK? So as I said, first we write Maxwell equations. And then we will spend the rest of the time in solving these equations to see how, uh, in fact, uh, 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 these solutions look uh, like. Uh, and so the first of these is, uh, uh, so there are two essentially about the E field. And the first say that the flux of E, I, I already wrote this. So let me just rewrite them because now I, I'm going to translate these words into equations, right? Because that's what we do in physics. We, we don't stop at this level. Uh, we, 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 we translate uh, this statement into an equation that then we, we know how to solve. So through any closed surface is equal, as we said, to the net charge inside, OK? Divide by a constant that uh, today we are going to say a little more about this uh, convenient constant that is put here. It also depends on the uh, uh, system uh, of units that you are using. So this is one of the not so nice things about, uh, OK? And, and let me, uh, and the other one uh, was about the circulation. So circulation of this uh, electric field around uh, some uh, loop that I call it C, is equal to the total derivative of what? Uh, of the flux of the other field, that is the B field, flux of B, uh, flux of B through, through S, where the relationship between C, so if this is C, S is a surface bounded by this uh, uh, line C, OK? Then uh, we said that the flux of B, so it's a sort of a reciprocal of this, the flux of B through any closed surface, so through any closed surface, is equal to what? Zero. So there is an asymmetry here. 
And finally, well, there is this constant, again, that, that depends on the, uh, of, of your units, but let me put it there. Uh, the circulation now of B around C, where C is any curve that I can draw, like S is any surface, uh, this is any closed surface. This is equal to two terms, one that looks a little bit like this, the total derivative of the flux of E now, of the electric field, through S, where again S is the, if this is C, this is S. Uh, there is a, a, another term that uh, is similar in a way to this one, but it has to do, since there are no magnetic uh, uh, charges, it, it has to do with the electric current. Uh, because you already know, I guess, that uh, it is the electric current that generates mag magnetic field. So it's the flux of electric uh, current through, again, S, divided by uh, this, uh, this same constant. So these are the Maxwell Equation. There are four equations, but there are four vectorial equations, so uh, the counting is really, uh, I guess, uh, three, six, seven, eight equations, right? And uh, the all of the, uh, uh, this uh, electrodynamics is, that, uh, is essentially this, uh, four, this uh, eight equations plus the Lorentz force that we discussed last time. So if you, everything is here, and all we need to do is to solve these equations and uh, the entire, uh, the physics of uh, the electromagnetic fields, it will uh, display its beauty. Exactly I, in classical mechanics, just by writing F equal MA, and then by solving that, uh, you, you find out all those beautiful things about the motion of planets and, and so on and so forth. So as I said, first I want to, recast uh, these, uh, I mean, these are nice. I hope you, you, you visualize those things. And also, I hope you, you refresh yourself about uh, uh, this uh, vector calculus that we are going to use a lot. So let me uh, 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 rewrite these things uh, um, using the, the, some ma mathematical language. So you see, we need to quantify uh, what is the flux of a vector field through a closed surface. This is the first, the first uh, mathematical object. And, and this is not that uh, uh, complicated, right? Because the flux is, is you know, you have a surface, it's like, uh, and then you have these vectors going through. I don't know, something like this. So what you need to do is, uh, is an integral, right? What is the flux of a vector through some surface? It's uh, the orthogonal component of that vector through the surface, and then you integrate over the whole surface, right? So this thing is just the integral over, over the, the surface of the, of the comp if n, so if this is the surface, this is n, so it's the component. So if E comes this way, you take the, the, comp the projection of your field over uh, the uh, orthogonal component and you integrate over the entire surface. So something like this. You can put D2 here to remind yourself that uh, that is a two-dimensional integral, right? So if you go to Cartesian coordinates, you have to integrate dx, dy. But usually people just write ds. So that is the translation flux of V through any closed surface is the integral of this, uh, uh, is, is that integral, whereas you can take it uh, to be a closed surface. But, it, okay. So I can replace that there, okay, with the more precise object that is the one I, I just wrote. So I take the integral of my field, E field, I project it out in the orthogonal, the norm, normal direction of my 
surface, uh, and this is the quantity I want. And this, if S is a closed surface, this must be equal to the net, so this 1 over epsilon 0 that is unfortunately there because of the units. And then what is the net charge inside? Right, you, you should, what you want to do here is to write everything with density, so you introduce the charge density that usually is called rho and is a function of the position, right? And then you integrate over the old volume uh, inside the surface. So you do a volume, I don't know, Vs, to remind ourselves that this is the volume. So if this is S, and this is the volume, Vs, right? So I integrate, so this is a, a it's a, it's a D3 Vs, right? So now I, I, I rewrote the first Maxwell equation in integral forms, and this is clearly a more precise statement than, but the meaning is exactly where we started from, the, what I wrote there. The, the, what is V? Is the volume inside, inside the surface? Ah? Yeah, why do you take the integral? Where? I mean, the, uh, why do you say integral to choose the, the volume? Well, just to remind myself that uh, it's a volume. But of course, you can do it. Since you are a stronger mathematician than I am, <laughs> you can write it this way. A, a, a you remember. so. It's OK. So this is a surface, and this is the volume. And that. So here I can remove that. How about the, the circulation? So as I said, here, first we, we, we wanted so a surface, and we have this field. Think of water again. It may be useful. And you want to quantify the amount of water going through this uh, uh, surface S, so this is the flux by definition, and this uh, comes with this, uh, with this uh, integral over the surface. Clearly, the circulation, so this has to, f has to do with the density of, of the velocity in, in the fluid. The other thing, so this tells you if here the current is stronger than there, right? If you swim in a river, the flux is, you know, where the current uh, is, is stronger, there the flux is, is larger. And where you have a nice pool, there the flux is much. Uh, but the other important information is whether there are whirlpools, right? If uh, the water does not go always in the same direction, it sort of turns around. So that's the other information that you want to know. Not only how dense these uh, force lines are, but also whether they turn around like this, right? Like this is a whirlpool. And to, to quantify this, you, you the clearly the, the, what you want to do is an integral, right? A line integral along a closed line like this. And if there is some amount of whirlpooling, this will be different from zero, right? If they are all like that, Right? If you go around some line like this, you get zero because, no. but if they really are whirlpooling, and then uh, it means that instead of sailing straight, you start going around faster and faster, like when you, in, in a, you open a sink, then uh, this is an information that ha has to do with the circulation. So circulation has to do with the, with the uh, let's put it here with the with the integral right along some uh, so you take an integral of what again of the projection <coughs> of the project so here at each point you have a vector you take the projection of this vector along this line so you take e scalar the the line element the line element is in this direction so you take the project on there and you integrate along some line so Usually, this is indicated, I guess, like this, if C is the line. OK? This, I, uh, this is all stuff that uh, I think you already know, so I'm just going through quickly because. Uh, 
Uh, and so here I can replace this circulation with this integral that I just wrote. So if I take the, the, the uh, line integral around, around the closed curve C, okay, of E, this is minus the dt of the flux of B through S. So of a, something like, like that, right? So the flux of the, on, on the surface S delimited by C, so I indicate the SC of BN dS without the two since uh, you are opposed to that notation. Okay? And now it's rather simple to write the remaining two, so let's forget about the Lorentz force for the moment. Let's just look at the fields. Uh, and so now I know how to immediately how to rewrite this equation here, because it's just this one where I replace the E field with the N field, and simply is telling me that the flux, as we said, uh, of the B field uh, through a closed surface is always zero. And uh, here too, I can replace this now. So let's do it. Let's see if I wrote it right. Uh, and uh, here, so. Uh, I have C square, right? The circulation, so C square, the circulation now of the B field around any, now there are many, this is C, the velocity of light, this is a, it's a different C, is uh, this uh, dt of the flux of E, so we know how to write this. plus the, the, the final term, that is the flux of electric current. Now, electric current, I'm going to call it J. So uh, again, it's like the charge, right? Uh, you, you have the charge, but then uh, this is some integral of a density of charge in a certain volume, OK? And here is the same. You are used to talk about the electric current, meaning the current you measure in a wire, right? Uh, but uh, this too comes from a, a, a integral over a density of, of current, right? You, it's obvious. And so here again uh, is not the, the, the total, uh, how to say, the, the integrated current that I'm talking about. I'm, talk, I'm talking about the density of current. So there is what I put. So it's 1 over epsilon, not the flux. So I, it's the flux, so something like this, through this uh, surface uh, uh, bounded, bounded by the curve C, okay, of this current, or better, the, because it's the flux, is the projection of your current in the direction normal to your surface S uh, sub C, and then you integrate. So I guess here I should put SC. So these are Maxwell equations, okay, in integral forms, they're called. In a second, we are going to rewrite them in a differential form by, by means of, uh, of uh, <coughs> Gauss and, and Stokes theorems. Uh, but uh, we can pause for a second and, and admire this beautiful set of equations. So you admire. <laughs> I hope that uh, we are building, so y now you already have some feeling. I mean, they are not just, uh, you know, brute integrals. Uh, you, you see that these uh, are connected with flux. These are the circulation. They are really describing the way this field, or for that matter, any other field 
uh, uh, is behaving. Uh, and in fact, the integral form is the, more, more, the most uh, intuitive one, is the most suggestive one, maybe. Uh, but as I said, uh, uh, mo most, of, uh, most of the time is the differential form, so the Maxwell equation that is more uh, handy in describing. So you may, so these are the equations. And you can imagine, I mean, yeah. There is a minus squared. Here you want a minus. No. There is no minus. Actually, this is a very important minus. So why, why you were happy with this minus? I mean, at this level, what, what, what do you care? Actually, this minus is very important. It has to do with the conservation of energy. We will see. It has to do with the length. What? Ah, oh, maybe I'm making a mistake. No, but I don't. So last time I put a minus here. OK, sorry. No, this minus is important. We will come back because it has to do with the conservation of the energy. And you understand this because you see here you have a very m magnetic field, OK? And this is inducing an electric field, OK? So you may think that by varying magnetic field, you induce an electric field. And then the electric field is inducing a magnetic field. In fact, this is what happens. But the direction of this uh, new field is going to be the opposite of the original one in such a way that you don't generate an infinite amount of energy by, by this trick. This is called length. Maybe you heard about this. This sign is, is, is due to length. I mean, it's not due to length. It's due to Maxwell. But uh, 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 the, 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 well, I don't know why length got the name there, but uh, it's called the length law. Okay. <laughs> Uh, what I wanted to say is that uh, imagine, uh, you, you see, we, we, from this thing here, uh, you know, how many things we could do with that, right? Uh, that is a much simpler set of equations. So you Im immediately have a, a rough idea of how much stuff you can derive from here. If, if we were able to derive you know, everything we did uh, before Christmas from this very simple, these are just three equations. And here we have a set of eight equations for two vector fields. So, I mean, clearly, this is a much broader uh, field of physics. Uh, and OK, so. Also, as I said the other times, this is really the beginning of modern physics, because uh, uh, we move from uh, uh, this kind of uh, motion of planets and uh, to really describing this uh, new phenomena that of electricity and magnetism, and we describe them in a completely new way through this uh, new idea of a field. Okay, this before uh, electromagnetism, essentially before Maxwell, uh, we didn't have this idea of a field. As I said last time, this is a very interesting idea that uh, you describe what happens always with quantities that vary locally, okay? Uh, instead of writing the force between two charges as an instantaneous interaction, you d describe this f as the interaction of this charge with the local field here, and you forget about the other charge. You substitute the idea of the force of this charge with, uh, uh, with these auxiliary things. At the end of the day, you, on you don't measure fields, right? You understand this. There is no, there is no instrument uh, to measure the E field directly. Uh, you don't have a E metro or whatever. I mean, something that measure. You always measure currents, charges, forces. Okay. So this is a purely auxiliary thing that you introduce to make your life easier. But also, it gives you this, the the possibility of describing everything uh, locally. Okay. But uh, in a way. Uh, I mean, the instruments, uh, we only measure charges and uh, forces and currents, uh, I guess. That is something like a force with a charge. You don't measure directly these things. It's, a, it's an, one level up in the abstraction, OK?
And as you will see, we will move immediately to the next step of abstraction because most of the time we will not even discuss about E and B fields. We will discuss about the potentials from which these fields can be derived. So, okay. So may, uh, since we are talking about forces, you may wonder what happened to Coulomb law. After all, everything starts from there, right? The the old Coulomb. Uh, law that says that two charges uh, attract and repel each other with a force that is uh, directly proportional uh, to the product of the charge, it's inversely proportional to the. So this could be a nice exercise, maybe. So I claim that essentially, uh, in fact, let's give a name. So this is Gauss law, right? Just to give a name to, to, to these things. Uh, and uh, uh, this is completely equivalent to the, to the Coulomb force even though it doesn't look uh, that way. So you, we, we may, so uh, very shortly we will re-derive Coulomb, fo Coulomb force from here, but it may be nice also to go the other way around. So if you assume that you, you have Coulomb force, is it true that you have Gauss law? So you want that as an exercise, or <laughs> is that clear what I'm saying? So I, I mean, we we we, we sort of uh, bootstrapped ourselves to the Maxwell equations, right? So I'm giving you this with as an act of faith, right? But one thing you know, I I hope, is Coulomb force, right? That uh, two charges, right? Two charges attract and repel each other with a force that is proportional to, to the product of the charges with the appropriate sign uh, inversely. So I guess uh, I can write it uh, like this. Uh, inversely proportional to, to the thing. So this, this they, they knew about this for a long time. In fact, it's one of the few things they knew before the 1800s, before, before the 19th century, right? This they knew. Essentially, they knew about this. They had very few charges right, around, but the few that they had, they roughly knew about this. And the other thing they knew was about this strange material from uh, some part of uh, northern Greece that was uh, magnetic, that they had these things, that uh, they had this property of, for instance, if you had uh, iron, it will move in a weird way under this magnetic field. By the way, this is the idea of where force lines come from, right? If you, if you put on a, uh, on a piece of paper some uh, fragments of iron, and then you put a magnet uh, below, you will see the force lines. They align, right, along this force line. So Faraday had the idea of force lines from there. So uh, the, they, they knew very little. They, 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 they were completely separate. So sometimes they, they knew about uh, magnetism, and the other hand, they knew something about char charges. And Coulomb verified, in fact, that the, the force was of this time. And of course, that was very exciting in a way because they knew about Newton's gravitational force, and it was exactly the same with the only difference that the, the charges were replaced by the masses and also the, the other very important property that there was no repulsion. Uh, it's always attractive gravity, right? Remember. Uh, of course, that's uh, a big difference. But uh, so, I mean, uh, so how do I go? My question is this, or if you want the exercise this, how do I go from this from to this? So how do I promote Coulomb law, Coulomb force to Gauss law that is one of the uh, Maxwell equations? So uh, you want to do it, and then uh, next week we solve it together? 
Okay. Is it clear? I mean, what? So you, you should uh, you should write the ah. So the E field is always what is uh, uh, the force right divided by the char charge that is uh, that is. Uh, uh, say generating if you are computing the E field for the charge Q1, right? I never said that, but uh, this is the idea. You introduce the, the E field. I never said because it's sort of, it's confusing from my point of view. I think that I know that the force is what you measure, but uh, fr from in this class, it's much better to think of the E field as the fundamental quantity. And then by, by multiplying, you know, you get the force. So you should write the E field for this, and then do some integral, and you will get the Gauss law. So we will discuss that. Okay, Monday, I think we don't have class, so maybe we just pile up all this exercise for the first Monday afterward, okay? Then we, we go. Okay, but uh, uh, preliminarily, uh, waiting for the, the correct answer, uh, we assume that this is true. So Gauss law is essentially the equivalent of uh, co the, the, the Coulomb force, but of course it's much more, it's much more because there is much more physics here than just in the, in the force, okay? So this is the exercise. Uh, by the way, by, uh, yeah. So by the way, you will see here in detail that uh, if there is no charge inside the volume, uh, 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 inside this surface, you will get zero, right? This is another property that comes exactly from the, the Coulomb uh, force. It's also, it really comes from the one over R squared behavior. So it's also true in a way, uh, it could be true, for, well, no. Uh, <coughs> okay. So to to move on, uh, so now uh, uh, we wrote the Maxwell equations uh, in integral form, uh, and I want to write them in a differential forms. Okay. And as I said, to do that, uh, I need two theorems. Uh, that I hope you 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 went to the library and uh, refreshed your memory about this. Did you? How many of you checked these two theorems? Did you? No. You already knew Gauss theorem and Stokes theorem, so you are already confident that. Uh, okay, good. I, I'm not going to prove them or to. I just uh, I just write them. So Gauss theorem is that theorem that link, so an integral. So you have a surface, okay, and, and you have the volume, okay? And you have a, let, let's call C this uh, vector field, so that then we, this C is going to be E, B, or whatever, or J, and, and you take the component, uh, the norm, normal component to the surface, and you integrate, okay? So essentially is again the flux, and Gauss theorem tells you that uh, this is equal to the volume inside this surface. So you have a surface, S, and inside you have this volume, V of S. And this is equal to this divergence of this vector field over the volume. So this quantity is called a divergence. divergence. Divergent. Yeah, sometimes I feel a bit dyslexic. Um, sometimes it's even written like this, divergence of C in some older books. But I, I like the... the the Nabla operator is called this one. You, you know about this operator. It's, you know, it's a vector with the component to be partial derivatives. So you, you are familiar with this stuff, I hope, right? 
if you are not, you, you, you go to the library, you, uh, you are not going to become familiar here. You are assumed to know this stuff. Uh, I mean, it's not difficult. In, uh, we, uh, we are going to use it. I mean, it's going to become like the Lagrangian equation for you, I hope. And the other theorem that we are going to need is the, this other guy. So Gauss was a German guy. Stokes was a, a British guy. Stokes, I guess I, it has an S at the end of the name, like Gauss. Of course, Gauss is, it should be something like this. Right, good. But okay, we are not German, so. And this has to do, well, no surprise, with the, with the circulation. So if you, again, you have a, a, a surface. So this time a surface like this. Uh, 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 no, the, and you have a boundary of this surface, like this C here, right, is the boundary. So this time I call it gamma, 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 the boundary. So gamma is the boundary of the surface. Hmm? Now if you integrate along the boundary, so like this, again a certain vector field. So this is like the circulation, right? By Stock, Stokes' theorem, this is related to a surface integral, so an integral over this surface, of the normal component of the curl. Remember, the curl is this thing here, or this vector. Okay, so if this was the divergence, this is the curl. Sometime again, curl of C. Uh, you integrate over the surface. Okay, that's all we need, clearly, because these two theorems allowed us to rewrite this as the integral over some volume or some surface equal to zero for an arbitrary volume or surface, right? Therefore, we can take whatever is inside the integral and put it equal to zero, and what we get inside the integral are going to be some differential uh, operators on vectors and therefore some differential equations. Okay, so let's do let's do that. Yeah, the homework. No, it's a homework, right? Otherwise, it would be a classwork. <laughs> no, we don't have time. Otherwise, we we stall at infinite. Uh, no, but okay, but we do it uh, together next uh, Monday. Um, Okay, so I need a little bit room here. So by, by means of these two identities, you see I can rewrite, for, for instance, let's start from the, from the first one. So I have a, a, a integral of this flux, right? But I see that the flux and I have a volume here on the other hand. So if I'm able to rewrite this surface integral in terms of a volume integral, right, I can put whatever is under the volume equal to zero because the vanishing of the integral over the volume, as long as the volume is completely arbitrary, implies the vanishing of whatever is inside. And therefore, if I, let, let's first rewrite this uh, as uh, you see, I can rewrite this flux by using uh, Gauss theorem into a integral over the volume uh, inside my, my surface of the divergence of E, right, over this Vs. And now, as I said, uh, I have, uh, you see, I have a volume that is uh, arbitrary. And these two quantities must be equal, therefore. So just a second. So that means that uh, in differential form, uh, uh, Gauss law is equivalent to, to this equation. Which one? Curl. Curl. This one, is that what? 
What is? La rotazione. Yeah, because it, 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 that's exactly what it is, right? Curl is a, you know, like a girl with curly, curly hair. <laughs> How do you call it in, in French? Rotation. Can't remember in Italian, I think. Rotation. Divergenza. La rotazione. Boh. Okay. So how about the, 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 the next one, the second one? Again, there, uh, uh, you see, I, I have uh, this surface integral. Hmm? Uh, it would be nice to rewrite this uh, circulation, this line integral, into a, a surface integral. But that's exactly what the Stokes theorem uh, 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 does for you, right? So again, I can rewrite that uh, E. I can rewrite the E as the integral over SC, the surface, uh, the boundary of which is, uh, uh, is C, <coughs> uh, the, the no, no, normal component of the curve of E, right, integrated over your surface is equal to this. Okay, but you see that this is the time derivative. I mean, this surface is arbitrary, and uh, you can keep it fixed. So you can bring the integral inside by making the total derivative into a partial derivative. Therefore, you see you have the normal component of the partial derivative with respect to t, uh, with respect to t of the B field is equal to the curl of E. So I can write my second Maxwell equation by simply the saying that the curve of E is equal to minus d dt of B. So these are the most, probably the form of the Maxwell equations you are already familiar with. And similarly, uh, okay, that, that one is very simple because you just want to, to put here the, the divergence, right? The divergence of, uh, of, of B is simply equal to zero. And finally, there, you have this C square. Now, by Stokes' theorem, I can replace that B by the curl of B. Right? And this is going by the same argument, you know, by the same token that I just used, is equal to the partial derivative with respect to time of the E field, so the variation of the field, plus what you have here. That is uh, 1 over epsilon naught, the electric current. So these are Maxwell equations in differential form. But it's nice at this level and, uh, to, to, you know, they are, compl well, they are obviously equivalent. Uh, and, uh, but this, this, the, the integral form suggests this interpretation in terms of fluids. And so at that point, by, by reading backward, you still remember that the divergence of something of a, of a field has to do with the, uh, you see, it has to do with the fact that inside some uh, volume you have uh, uh, charges, okay? And charges are sources of the, of the field, okay? So if you, if you see that the divergence of a vector field uh, vanishes, that means that there are no sources for that field. That's exactly the property of B. Remember what we said last time. Why, uh, by looking at here, the Gauss law is just telling you that the source of the electric field is the electric charge, OK? This is the density of charge. And 
and this is the density of electric current. Okay? And the other two, so these two are a sort of a basic equations telling you about the, the, the way the flux of electric and magnetic fields are produced. Okay? So the first one tells you that uh, 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 if you have an electric charge, then uh, you know that the, the force line, right, they come out like this. And therefore, if you take a volume, you will have a net result that is not, not vanishing. And the divergent is that the differential operator that exactly take into account the things, okay? Vice versa, for the B field, you don't have a, a, a monopole. You don't have a source of magnetic field, okay? Each time you have a magnetic, a, a, a piece of, a, 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 for instance, a piece of, of iron that is made into a magnetic, it, it, the force lines are something like this, right? Or like this. And therefore, each time you take a surface, you get zero. That's exactly the property of the magnetic field. So in other words, this is the Gauss law. This is the, you can call it no monopole. There are no monopoles, maybe. But here, there are no monopoles. The other tools, as you see, they relate the electric and the, uh, and the, uh, and the, uh, and the magnetic fields. But uh, first, uh, if you look uh, at the static limit, you see that uh, as the electric charge uh, generates the electric field, you may wonder what is generating the magnetic field. Where does it come from? It comes from the current. So if you have a wire, this was the original observation, with some electricity going around, you have a magnetic field generated, right? Orsted, this, this uh, Swedish or Swedish, uh, or Nor Norwegian, or Danish, right? Danish maybe, well, somewhere up there. <laughs> he, he was showing the students about the electricity. He had two wires going uh, in the opposite direction, and he noticed that they, they attract each other. That was very surprising, right? And uh, why they attract each other? Because if you have a wire, as we will see, you have a magnetic field going around. And the magnetic fields interact with the current that is the electric field uh, uh, interacts with the other wire inducing an electric field that will pull the wire closer or away depending whether the current goes in the same or the opposite direction. So it's very similar. It's like the electric charge, but it's not, you know, the current is just electric charges moving. So you only have electric charges. Then if they move, they, they, they produce a current that the itself produces a, a B field. Okay, that's the trick. And also you see that the only thing you have are charges. So you may wonder what is the, the what is producing the magnetic field in the, in the, in the magnetic piece of, of what, how it's called, I don't know. This, uh, there are some tiny, teeny, tiny electric currents inside this material producing the magnetic field. <coughs> OK. Questions? Everything, is everything clear or? So now, <coughs> okay, let's uh, uh, erase this integral form. Let's stay with the differential form. So all I want at this level is that if you see this symbol, you think of fluxes coming out, something, you know, like, and if you see a curl, you think of stuff going around, okay? Because that's what they do. They tell you, they tell you how these uh, fields are, are behaving. So if the, whether they are, there is stuff coming out, if there are sources, uh, and or if it's just going around, okay? This is the curl. It goes around. The current is inside. Now, okay, this we don't need it. Uh, uh, please memorize these equations. You should know them by heart. I mean, 
like you know f equal ma that's the other and you see they, they fit on the t-shirt so I mean it's really something <laughs> now first things uh, maybe it's useful uh, to uh, so this is another exercise uh, so those are uh, Maxwell equations and, and they are nice and they are written in vectorial form as, as we already discussed uh, in our uh, classical mechanics class I mean vectors are nice because they are sort of invariant right they, it's just a vector then you can rotate your your uh, axis and the vector just remain the same but when you need to do a computation you have to go to the components right this is the hard true uh, and so the exercise is please write the, the Maxwell equations in components. What, what, that, what, what, what I mean by that? I mean uh, uh, that uh, you, you want to write this by, by writing the E and the B. You see, these are E and B, right? They are vectors. But they have component along some axis. So if you introduce axis, you are going to get... Uh, so these are the, 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 the three space-like axes, okay? And, and, and you have components, right? And again, here you have some sort of, is this clear, right? This is a vector, right? So if, uh, if I introduce a set of coordinates, this vector is going to have the Z component, the, the, the Y and the X component. This is what I mean. So if you plug this in here, then you get the equations by component, okay? And this is useful for you because you understand how you write the components of this. And also useful because in the final step of this series of lectures, we will write these equations in, in space time. And there we, will, we, we don't have vector in, the, in space time. We have four vectors and there is no little arrow notation there. We do everything. Well, there is, but we are not going to use it. We do everything by components, okay? So it's a nice way to... And just uh, you have to remember how to write these operators in component. So think about or go to, to a book or on Wikipedia or whatever. And then we will write this Maxwell equation in components. So I hope I remember... I, I, because I assign these problems, then I forget. So you remind me. Uh, okay, I, is the problem clear or? No, for, for all, for, well, actually, why, 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 how many are these equations? I already told you, but uh, let's count them together. How, how many equations do you see there? I mean, there are four, I know, but uh, how many when you write them in components, that is what you have to do to solve them. How many? No, 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 no. It depends. No, how many equations? Uh, because, w w so how do you count equations? If you ta 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 equal to zero, that's yeah. one equation. Okay, we have twelve. So right, sorry. I already told you. No, three. Eight. Other guesses. <laughs> how do you count equations? So, so how many equations is this? Because you have to be careful, right? Because you have this, this arrow, that means you have many components, right? But how many, but it's true that you have many components here and here, but how many equations, how many uh, equations do you have? How many zeros here? For just the, let's fo focus on this one. How many equations is this? One. Okay. How many of these? Okay, I'm sorry. It, it may be stupid, but it's better be stupid than sorry, right? <laughs> How many equations here? Three. So, okay. But it does not depend on, uh, on anything. No, but that's a different thing. I'm, I'm just saying, I, I don't know anything. I just want to count how many the equations. Maximum number is the maximum. Well, there are eight equations. I wrote eight equations. Then the solution may be you know, simpler if you have some symmetries. 
So you have eight equations, and that will become clear when you write the components, OK? So one shouldn't really say the four actual equations, the, the, the eight actual equations, or the 12, uh, we discover, as we <laughs> discover here. OK. Ah, because, OK, 8, 20. <laughs> OK, you can add the Lorentz force. That's how many? 3. By the way, if you, that's another nice thing. So you can go, they have here Maxwell's book. The, tra the treaty about uh, on electricity is very nice. Eh? And you will see how it just takes pages just to write the equations because Maxwell didn't know about this nice vectorial symbol. He didn't know about vectors. So he did everything by components. So if you go to Maxwell's book, you will see only the component structure. So this is written by components. The vector calculus came just afterward. Yeah, so I don't know. Maybe you are right. Uh, check. I, I see only eight, but uh, you never know about it. Uh, so, yeah. yes? Uh, is the lens also supplied in between? Which one? Between the lens force. No, that's what I said. You have to add, so the all of electro magnetic theory is this eight equation plus three Lorentz because they don't te they tell you how the E and the B field changes according to the presence of charges and currents but they don't tell you how the current the currents or if you want the, the, the charges move under the effect of these fields so it's like a two right So this describes the fields. One, once you know the fields, you go back to last lecture, you write Lorentz force, and then you solve that force, and you f discover how the charges move uh, because of the presence of those fields. That's the technique. So E is pointing in Z direction. Okay. Maybe um, on one axis we will get zero. We can we can uh, put the other bit. When you will apply the operator. Okay, maybe E Z is zero. Right. So what? But like I mean we can just uh, uh, for three we can uh, get two. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, but that's a particular situation. I'm I'm not saying that you always have uh, I say, in general, these are these equations. Then uh, you can always think of some situation in which you will see. We, will, we are going to, you are going to be sick about these equations. We are going to study them in many details. And we will see that are, most of the cases, you don't need the full. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, the homework is uh, to, to get this uh, in components that is it's a useful exercise. Instead, we can do uh, 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 there is some some time uh, beside the Lorentz force. People add the, the the continuity equation. That is this equation here. Right? You see, it's called continuity because it tells you that uh, if you have, uh, so this is the differential form, but I think now use Gauss and, and Stokes theorem. So it, it just tells you that if, if inside a volume you see a, a variation of charge, that means you have some flux of current through the surface bound in that volume. So that's called the continuity.
right? You see, it's like the conservation of charge, but it's a little more because you see this is a conservation that is local. Because it's not, you see, conservation of charge could be that I destroy a, a, a positive charge here and a friend of mine on Andromeda, you know, light years away, is creating a charge there. For the universe, the total charge is the same. So that's the conservation of a charge. So that means that uh, dQ dt is equal to zero for the universe, whatever that thing is. But here I'm not saying just this. I'm saying something stronger. I'm saying that if I have a charge here and it disappears, it has to go through the door, right? Somebody has to take this charge and go away. This is a local conservation. It's a much stronger, okay? Do you agree? This is very important. It's one of the basis of modern physics. Quantum field theory of interactions is based essentially on this idea, the local conservation of charges, maybe the electric charge or something more complicated. But it's really basic. And it was born here. OK? So the exercise here, so this is the continuity equation, or if you want, also known as the conservation of charge, the local conservation of a charge. And uh, 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 what I, uh, the, the exercise here, so I guess this is homework number three, is really you don't need to add this. It's not like the Lorentz force that I, I'm for, I, I have to add it. By using the Maxwell equations, you should derive this. It's very simple. But the important point is that the continuity equations, the conservation, the local conservation of the charge, is a consequence of Maxwell equation. So please try and uh, it's just two, two steps uh, and derive this, uh, this very important uh, continuity equation for the Maxwell equation. Uh, continuity equations, yes. So if you, if you wish, this is stronger than this, because this really tells you that you cannot destroy charges. They are indestructible, right? Here you can destroy a charge as long as you create another one somewhere, uh, somewhere else. You destroy it in Trieste, you create one in Venice. But here, you know, I have to take the train. <laughs> it has to go all the way. As you know, it's, it takes a long time to get to Venice by train, <laughs> thanks to the Italian railways. OK. So uh, so I guess uh, there are two more things. But I was hoping to, to do it today, but I'm not sure that we can do it. So let, let me first uh, say a few things about these units. The, the, how you measure these fields, because this is a, okay, up to here, everything is beautiful. <laughs> now uh, we, we get to the ugly stuff. But uh, we will essentially sail over it as, as much as we can, because I, I really don't like it. It's what makes the, the equations complicated. Uh, the first thing is, the, as I said, I mean, there are different, uh, well, that's uh, everywhere in physics. You have different set of, uh, uh, you can pick your units. When you measure something, you can pick uh, centimeter, meters, you know, kilos, grams, and here's the same. And depending on w what units you pick, you get different equations. This is really ugly, right? in a way, because F equal MA is the same whether you are using MKS or CGS system. So that's good. Uh, but here, uh, these C factors and this epsilon zero, they fluctuate uh, through different uh, conventions. So let me state from the beginning, so we will sort of oscillate, uh, as you will see, between two systems. Uh, 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 one is this one. Uh, this is the international uh, system, the SI system of units. Uh, uh, and these are Maxwell equations 
equations in that system. But um, if you may open a book, you may see a, a completely different, well, not a completely different, a different set of equations in which the good news is that you don't have this uh, epsilon naught things that uh, I'm going to define shortly. But uh, uh, you get all these weird 4 pi factors. And in these units, your Maxwell equations are these. So don't be alarmed if uh, if you find this. So that's perfectly fine. Actually, I grew up with this uh, set of equations, but uh, I understand that this is more standard. But it's just this is CGS or Gauss. This is the SI. And there are other systems. For instance, uh, Heaviside and Lorentz, two physicists, uh, to physicists who work on that a lot, uh, uh, in fact, they say, "Why should I have? Uh, why should I have uh, this four pi here?" And they simply re reshuffle and they eliminate the four pi. Okay, so you can even see this without the four pi, but with the one over c everywhere. And this is called the heavy side Lorentz uh, natu natural unit. Sometimes, okay. So this is the first thing I, I wanted to, <coughs> to say. And the second thing, I, I, so uh, are we agree on that? Okay. I, I, I will mostly stick to this uh, 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 international system because uh, I see that now most textbooks follow this. But for instance, Landau's book is like that. Uh, and. Uh, uh, and maybe I will, uh, sometime I, I will, uh, because this is the way I remember the equation, so sometime I will slip back to there. So if you see 4 pi appearing, that means it's not that I'm putting there some weird thing. It's just I'm, I'm, I'm writing this in the other uh, set of uh, uh, units. Uh, the other thing uh, uh, is uh, what, what, what is this epsilon naught, right? Right, so where does it come from? Where, where, yeah, where does it come from? Uh, so this is the boring stuff, but uh, we have to, to do it, I guess. Well, I, as I said, uh, re really, we don't measure the, the E and the B field. We measure forces. So really, in this game, there are three forces as we, in a way, I already told you, but I sort of, because I like the fields, I don't like the forces, I sort of size, size you know. But at this point, there is no way to, around that, we have to. So there is the Coulomb force, as I said, that tells you that uh, a force, there is a force that is proportional. This is the, so I call it this a K1 constant to the product. So if you have two charges, you have this force, right? Let me put a, a cube here so that. Uh, Okay, and of course, uh, what this proportion proportionality constant is is an experimental question. I mean, it's not decided here uh, because we like it or because of the symmetry or because of the beauty of the equations. It's an experimental measurement that fixes that constant, and, uh, and then uh, you measure everything with that. And uh, this this. The Gauss system is such that this constant is defined to be 1. Okay, so you measure, what, what does it mean? That you measure your charges in such a way that the force due to Coulomb force is equal to 1 times the product of the charges. Okay, so it's a convention. You start measuring the charge in this way. And the other convention that is the international system is instead that this proportionality factor is 1 over 4 pi epsilon 0. And this epsilon 0 is this uh, permittivity 
of the vacuum, because then we move to the next ugly subject, is what happened when, when this field, I think I, I, I it's like, a, you know, if your trousers <laughs> drop <laughs> while you are talking, uh, uh, is what happened when this field go into, into matter, because that is a complicated question that, uh, well, we'll see if we can do it today. Okay, so this quantity is, uh, so this is an experimental quantity and is measured and is equal to, if I'm correct, uh, uh, now 4 pi c square 10 to the 7th, so ampere per second volt per meters. So this constant is equal to this. This is an experimental measurement. We, we are not very interested in this, but uh, this is just a number, and uh, you also see the units. By, by means of these units, you can recover what are the units of all the other quantities, okay? What is the other force? The other force is the, 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 the one that I just, we were discussing, the one that was noticed by Ørsted, and was really studied by Ampere. So this is Coulomb. Then this other guy is Ampere. This is a Frenchman. That, again, uh, sort of quantify this fact that if you have electric uh, currents in wires running parallel, the, the wires attract or repel according to. So this force here, let's call it, uh, well, let, let's write it in differential form. You have a, is proportionally to the, to the value of the currents going through the wires, right? Like here you have the charges. And then uh, some factor that I wrote here. So you have two wires, two small elements on these wires, ds1, ds2, okay? With the distance r1, 2 between these two, uh, and you have a current. I1, I2, and they attract, if this goes here like this, with a force that is proportional to this. So it looks a little bit like this, where you replace charges with currents, not quite so. But again, you have another constant here, and what is this constant? Again, in the Gauss system, this K2 is just 1 over C squared. <coughs> and that explains the C squared coming out somewhere. And the international system is just a mu zero, that is a new constant, that is the, the magnetic equivalent of the epsilon zero of the vacuum. This again is a number, and actually once I give you epsilon zero, I don't need to give you what is mu zero, because the beautiful thing is that the, the velocity of light is exactly one over the square root of the product of epsilon naught time mu naught. From here already, you can see, of course, this was done afterward, after Maxwell uh, uh, discovered that uh, uh, this c is the velocity of light. But uh, since we already know that, uh, we can already see that uh, there is a profound link between property of the electric field and the magnetic field and the velocity of light. C. So again, you have three things that look uncorrelated, light, electric field, magnetic field, and they are brought together by the Maxwell equations. And what is the third force is Lorentz force. Okay? And that, again, I can write as a third constant, K3, because I know that the force is proportional. Uh, uh, let, let's just look at the magnetic part. It doesn't matter. Uh, 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 like this, the velocity cross the B field. And again, uh, K3 is equal to 1, or K3 is equal to C, depending. So K3 is equal to C. Remember when I wrote the, the Lorentz force, I didn't have the 1 over C in the magnetic term because I'm using this interna uh, uh, international system. But if I use Gauss system, I would have had 1 over C in front of the magnetic term in the force because in that system, 
your charges, velocity, B fields are measured in such a way that this constant is exactly one, like for the curve. OK, so that's the origin of these uh, weird numbers appearing, popping out somewhere in our equations and sort of spoiling the, the simplicity. Uh, uh, but if you don't like this epsilon naught, of course, uh, you, you prefer the Gauss system. Uh, uh, but then you pay this 4 pi. And then if you don't like the 4 pi, you like the heavy side Lorentz system that obviously is the best one. But uh, OK, you have to do what uh, the other people you know, if you don't do the same, uh, nobody will understand you. So, uh, so doesn't matter. I mean, just pick the system you prefer, but then uh, be clear on, on that. Uh, so that was about the the units, I guess. Uh, maybe I should say. Uh, so, in fact, at this point, one sh is more or less ready to. So, what are uh, so if you measure the e electric field, what are the units of this thing? Coulomb divided by, yes, and uh, so that's a volt, right, <laughs> divided by meters, I guess, right? In fact, the, the electric field is volts per meter, over meter, right? No. And how about the magnetic field? That's the Tesla. That's right. That is that is ten three ten thousand Gauss, and those are uh, volts per second divided by meter square, I guess. Okay, you, you it's not very often that you are required to, <laughs> but just to I mean they they are still uh, physical quantities, so they must be they are pieces of the fundamental units, CGS. Or, uh, so now I see I, 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 I wanted to do uh, last things, uh, but maybe we can. Uh, let me just say that, then we do it on Friday. Uh, uh, as I said, uh, these are sort of the Maxwell equations in, in vacuum far away from everything in empty space. That is our um, favorite uh, laboratory, right? Because everything is simple. Like for mechanics, we, we like not to be in any gravitation or no frictions. And, but the harsh truth is that uh, these fields are always in some medium, like in this room. I mean, they are not in the vacuum. They are through tables, chairs, air, walls. So what happened? You see, the problem is that matter is uh, itself made of atoms, and those are made of charged particles. So as soon as you have an electric field going through a wall, that electric field is modifying the structure of that wall, and those atoms are reacting, producing themselves another electric and maybe magnetic field. So. This is sometimes is called the microscopic, meaning uh, in the vacuum, essentially, form of the Maxwell equations. But again, in the books, you will see very often what is called the macroscopic, meaning on a larger scale, uh, Maxwell equations. And those are where you see that the D fields and H fields that probably you were wondering about or not. Have you seen the, because there is E and B, and there is H and D, unfortunately. And everything is simple in terms of E and B, but unfortunately, you will see in the textbooks H and D. So what the hell, right? They come from this fact that they are in the vacuum. When these fields penetrate matter, they induce some other electric and magnetic fields, and you have to take this into account. So the physical quantity, what you actually measure, are not this, are this D and H field. Because there is no way that you can measure an electric field without some medium back reacting on that, OK? This is unfortunate, because this is you know, it's crystal clear. As soon as you introduce this D, I hate this uh, D and H field. As a student, 
I could never understand why they were doing all this with this D and H field. And in fact, I still don't understand it completely. Uh, but the reason is clear, right? That uh, uh, you, you have a microscopical level, you produce some uh, uh, extra charges and extra currents, and these extra currents and extra charges are going to contribute to the Maxwell equation. So if you want to take this into account, you have to introduce, as we will see next time, this D and H field, okay? So there is no big mystery, as I discovered myself as a student. It's just that you want to take into account all these things, okay? And when you do that, you get the Maxwell equations in the, in the final forms, I guess, in which uh, here you, uh, you have uh, only the external charges and only the external currents, meaning really stuff that you have put there. But, I mean, these are perfectly fine, but the problem is that in this row and this J, I should also include the extra charges and extra currents that uh, these fields are inducing into the medium. So if you want to pull this out and have here only the external rho and external J, here you have to replace somewhere this H and D fields. Okay, so we will see that uh, next time. Uh, and also, the, uh, I mean, we see them and then we forget about because I don't like that and I'm not going to discuss that further, okay? But you need to know because otherwise, you know, Somebody comes around and start talking about H and D, and they say, but I only know about B and E. <laughs> so what is this? <laughs> okay, so uh, we will uh, finish this on, on, on Friday. <laughs>